Hello everyone and welcome back to The Beatles Forever. Today we're going to see The Beatles from the perspective of Peter Asher. He is Jane Asher's brother and almost was a brother-in-law to Paul McCartney. The idea was given to me by a viewer and it sounded like a good idea. So we're going to see how Peter came to know The Beatles and how he got into music. Peter grew up in a house of music. His father was an amateur pianist and a lover of Gilbert and Sullivan. He was a physician. His mother was an oboe professor at the Royal Academy of Music. She played various orchestras and gave oboe lessons at their home. And Peter, by the time he was 14 or 15, had piano lessons, instructions on the oboe and the double bass. And he said he was too lazy to be competent in any of those instruments. He started to like American music, and then he got a guitar and learned a few chords. He met a friend named Gordon Waller at the Westminster School of, in London. They liked the same music, and they began to sing together and play pubs and clubs and called themselves Peter and Gordon. And one night, a manager from EMI Records asked him if they would go for an audition at the studios, and they said yes. They needed some songs, though, and as luck would have it, Jane was dating Paul, and he had moved into their house, and he was living in the guest room at the top of the house next to Peter's bedroom. And Peter got a chance to hear songs that he was writing, and one song that Paul was writing was a world without love. Peter only heard a part of it, but he liked it and told Paul so. The Beatles decided the song wasn't for them, and they didn't want to record it. John didn't like the lyrics and that began the song, which were, Please Lock Me Away. <laughs> so then Peter asked Paul if it was okay if he and Gordon could record it, and Paul said, Yes, you may. And Paul was being a nice guy, and he wrote out the lyrics and the chords for Peter. And he recorded a little demo so they wouldn't mess up when they did a recording. Peter says he still has that demo. And it's neat that Paul made the recording in Peter's bedroom on a reel-to-reel -reel tape machine in 1963. Peter and Gordon recorded the song January the 24th, 1964, along with four or five other songs. And they felt A World Without Love was going to be their first single. And they picked a good one because the song was a hit. And it was number one in the UK, number one in Europe, and number one in America. And it meant a lot to them because they loved America and American music. And the verse head of A&R for Apple Records. Peter worked with all the Beatles in trying to find new talent. And Peter met James Taylor then and signed him as his first recording contract. Later, Peter went on to Sirius XM's The Beatles Channel called From Me to You, where he would spin records and tell about his experiences in the music business, and they all connected to the Beatles, and this started in 2017. Peter ended up making the book named The Beatles from A to Z, and I'll go through the book and find the most interesting things from it, and I think we'll all feel that we can never find out enough about the Beatles, so let's get started. <laughs> First up, something. Uh, George Harrison came out with the song Something from Abbey Road, and James Taylor, he had a song called Something in the Way She Moves for an album made for Apple Records. A short time after that, George came up with the song that contains some lyrical phrase, Something in the Way She Moves. And James Taylor explained that in his song, Something in the Way She Moves, he had borrowed the lyric, I Feel Fine, from the Beatles song of the same title. So Peter said that borrowing goes on in every direction all the time, but no one's complaining because some really good songs have the borrowed lyrics. The next song, And I Love Her, Peter and Paul remember that Paul played the song in Peter's family home, and whoever was at home at the time, he was at the grand piano in the main upstairs sitting room. Back off Boogaloo. Ringo wrote this song, and he was really jolly and enthusiastic on it. Ringo was inspired by Mark Bolin and his band T-Rex, and Mark encouraged Ringo to write the lyrics and begin the song. And George Harrison, he helped Ringo finish the song and produce the record for him. It sounds like George was a great friend. And the dynamic duo of Ringo and George came up with a catchy song, and it was a hit. Now we have Cracker Box Palace. This song was recorded with top-notch All-American Rhythm Section. George did the great guitar work, which makes it sound like a Beatles song. Alvin Taylor played drums, and Willie Weeks played the bass. And they were each great in their own way and created a sound that was different from what Paul and Ringo would have come up with. George sounded like he was having fun with the song, and Peter said it was one of his favorite tracks. It's one of mine, too. <laughs> Cracker 
Cracker Box Palace was George's nickname for his new home, Friar Park. George saved the house from de demolition and wrote a song about it and made a video for the song. It was directed by Eric Idle and filmed at Friar Park. George's future wife, Olivia, was in the video. Peter said that today Olivia is the current mistress of the park and has kept the house and grounds looking more beautiful than ever. Harrison didn't come up with the name Cracker Box Palace. It originated with Lord Buckley, and he named it for a house he had. Now we have the continuing story of Bungalow Bill. John Lennon wrote this song while he was in India, and he wrote it to make fun of an American visitor who went out into the jungle to shoot tigers. Peter said it was John at his most sardonic and satirical, and he could write a catchy chorus. And it's funny that John would get on Paul for his musical approach to songs, but in this song, John had that sound. Now we have Day Tripper. This was a great guitar riff at the beginning of the song, and Peter thought that the riff owed a bit to the riff in the Temptation song, My Girl. The song was half of a single, with the other half being We Can Work It Out. So it was two great songs for the price of one. And then the lyrics were discussed. In England, a day tripper is someone who goes on one day vacation. So Peter used the example of going to the seaside and then going back home that same night. In the U.S., the term isn't as common, but it means the same thing. She was a day tripper, only here for one day. He didn't think the Beatles meant the song to be about drugs, because at that time they would have been thinking of the song as a person going for a day trip. Paul McCartney liked the lyrics, She's a Big Teaser, the way it's phonetically, and if you weren't listening closely, you would misinterpret the line to mean a woman who was promising physical delights, a promise she didn't mean to deliver. The Day Tripper song was one that John mainly wrote himself, with Paul helping to finish it. Drive My Car. This song was mostly written by Paul. There were subtle sexual references with the lines, You Could Do Something In Between, and I could show you a better time. But this wasn't unusual in rock and roll. The early rock song, Rock Around the Clock, really wasn't a song about dancing. And George Harrison had a lot to do with the arrangement of the song, and he provided the great guitar licks. Don't Pass Me By. Ringo wrote this song for the album The Beatles. Ringo was having a country vibe in this song. The fiddle was played by Jack Fallon. He was born in Canada in 1915. Paul played the bass guitar and the piano, and Ringo played drums. He sang and added percussion. Peter said that Jack the fiddle player had a charming loose old time to his fiddle part, and it had a wobbly intonation that worked well with the strange piano sound. They created that piano sound by feeding the piano through a Leslie speaker. Then we come to Peter talking about drumming Ringo style. Peter brings up that when people hear a great drum sound, they ask, what kind of drums does he use? What kind of sticks? Peter didn't think it was relevant. Pete Ringo has his own style of playing. The way he hits the hi-hat, his weird backhand feels. Peter said it was because Ringo is a left-handed drummer on a right-handed kit. On a day in the life, Ringo does the fill with a cool and thumpy weird sound. Some drummers try to fill every tiny moment in the bar, something Keith Moon was famous for but Ringo style had specific fills placed in the right spot. In this song, Ringo starts each fill on the snare, which was unusual. Peter said that most drummers would go for the tom-toms first. Peter also loved Ringo's drumming on She Said, She Said from Revolver. It had an amazing drumming. And then the song Rain is a song that shows Ringo at his best. He used the hi-hat as part of the fills. Dear Prudence, John wrote this song about Mia Farrow's sister Prudence. This is while they were all in India. Prudence wouldn't come out of her room. She was trying to meditate, and John wrote the song in an attempt to get her back out into the outside world. And the song was also kind of a tribute to Buddy Holly from a song he had entitled Raining in My Heart. It had the lyric, the sun is out, the sky is blue, and John changed his lyric to the sun is up, the sky is blue. So John and all the Beatles love Buddy Holly, so it was John's admiration for Buddy to retweak the lyrics. Don't Let Me Down. It was on the B-side of Get Back, and it was recorded at Trident Studios, not Abbey Road. Mal Evans, the road manager for the Beatles, and Jackie Lomax, who was an English guitarist and singer-songwriter, they were on the background vocals, and it's neat to know that. 
It is the song in which John is asking Yoko not to let him down. Do you want to know a secret? Another John song. John wrote it and George sang it. John was inspired by his mother and she sang him the Disney song, I'm Wishing, and the song opens up with the lyric, Want to Know a Secret? Promise Not to Tell? And John said he was one or two at that time. John explained that he had had this song in his head and he wrote it and he gave it to George to sing. And John said, I thought it would be a good vehicle for him because it only had three notes and it wasn't, and George wasn't the best singer in the world. But then John didn't want to act like he was insulting George too much. He said that later on, George improved a bit. But in those days, his singing ability was poor because A, he hadn't had the opportunity and B, he concentrated more on the guitar. The song was a hit and it got to number two on the Billboard Hot 100. So I'm going to end the video here. Uh, Peter Asher came up with a different idea in relating his experiences with the Beatles and with music in general. And I'll do another video based on his thoughts soon. I'm glad there's so much material that we can go through and, and learn more about our favorite band through different perspectives. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, if you could give it a thumbs up, it would be greatly appreciated, as always. And I wish everyone a good day, and tune in again soon for another episode of The Beatles Forever. Thank you. Bye.